Well, good. Hello, everyone. It's a fabulous uh, day today here in Brisbane in the morning, and I'm so honoured today to have our guest, uh, Helen Clark, with us today. Um, and hello to you, Helen, and thank you so much for coming to us from the Bay of Plenty in New Zealand. Uh, it's an honour and a privilege to have you um, in conversation with our participants today. As everyone knows, the Remarkable Women Powerful Stories is a leadership series by Zonta International. And I thank you all for joining me today. I'm Lynn Foley, the chairman of the Zonta International Leadership Development Committee and hosting this series is one of the best things I do every month. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and also pay that respect forward to any nations, First Nations people present. Zonta International is a leading global organization of professionals empowering women worldwide through service and advocacy. Zonta is now in its second century and has more than 28,000 members in 64 countries, where we all work together to make gender equality a worldwide reality for women and girls. So now let me introduce uh, a little more formally, Helen Clark, who's joining me, as I said, from the Bay of Plenty in New Zealand. Helen has uh, is such a, a strong, well-known global leader and has been for much of her career and as the first woman elected as Prime Minister of New Zealand and serving three terms and her government promoting reconciliation and settlement of historical grievances with Indigenous people and the development of an inclusive multicultural multi-faith society. And um, as we all know, Helen's a very, very strong advocate for New Zealand's comprehensive program on sustainability, including on addressing climate change. Uh, Helen moved on to be the administrator of the United Nations Development Program and the chair of the United Nations Development Group. And of course, since then has been working um, diligently and in many aspects for the UN and in other places of the world. So as a champion of inclusive and sustainable developments, and I also know a champion of gender, gender equality uh, and also a Zonta International Honorary Member who spoke at our convention in 2018 in Yokohama, it is indeed a pleasure to, member, to welcome a member of the family of the Zonta family today. So Helen, um, good morning in New Zealand and uh, lovely to have you. You're still on mute, Helen. Greetings everyone uh, around the world and some probably in not as conducive a time zone as New Zealand and Australia. Thank you. So let's start the conversation. I, I'm really interested to start it with where and how your story began. You know, where did Helen Clark begin? Well, don't, don't all fables begin with once upon a time. So yes. uh, <laughs> once upon a time, <laughs> I, I was a, a small girl growing up on a farm in the Waikato uh, region of New Zealand, which is about, um, well, about two hours southwest of, of Auckland. And uh, I was the eldest of, of four girls uh, in our family. I often say my luckiest break growing up on a farm in the 1950s in New Zealand was to be the eldest child in a family of four girls because there were no boys to compete with. And uh, with farming families where there were boys, the boys did things on the farm with dad and the girls did things at home with mum. Well, <laughs> dad had no sons, so the girls did everything. And that was the way my life was. I, I went from there to an all-girls boarding school in Auckland. The teachers were all women. I, you know, every role model was, was, was female there. And it really wasn't until I went to university where, where women were in equal numbers with the, the men's students that I noticed that the teachers were very seldom women. And that was my first insight, really, into seeing a world that wasn't dominated by by women, and it was quite a reality check. And you know, things got a bit harder going from there as as I became one of the first to, you know, be in that that wave of post World War Two baby boomers who broke through the the barriers. And there was no red carpet put out for us. We had to roll it out ourselves. <laughs> but uh, hey, you know, th th those are the lessons you learn along the way. And make it easier for the, the next generations who come. 
Yes, it's it's a privilege, isn't it? I guess to be in the baby boomer, those of us in the baby boomer world. Um, but in your case, it was like you must have felt like you were carrying that red carpet along with you, and then you rolled it out to to yeah. build on your metaphor. Yes, it's uh, it's a really uh, was an interesting time. So, given uh, I guess you grew grew up in that female dominated world until university, what? decided you to choose that path of arts and politics that you did that took you to be a political leader or did it happen to you was it a choice you know sometimes we start to study and then we find that other times we've actually made the choice interesting so at, at my girls grammar school uh, i i was in the languages stream i studied french and latin and, and german and history, which was my favorite subject, and, and also English, which was core yeah. in the curriculum. So preparing to go to university, often you look at studying the things you studied at school. Yeah. And so I was on a course to study English and, and history and uh, chosen German. And then I met a student at the university who said to me, political studies is really interesting. And I thought, well, maybe I'll enroll in that as a fourth subject. <laughs> and of course, my family had been quite political uh, across the spectrum, I might say. You know, there's someone mm -hmm. from every political tendency in the family, but I was used to hearing politics discussed <laughs> against the old family rule never discuss politics and religion. Well, we did discuss politics as a family mm. with, with a lot of different views. So I enrolled in political studies. And that turned out, of course, to be the subject that really uh, captivated me. And I remember by, by the time I was in my third year in history and the courses were quite specialised, for example, you know, Georgian England, I was thinking, I'm not sure that I'm really relating to this with, with a passion. But what I did relate to was learning about political systems and international affairs. So that, that's where it comes from. Now, bear in mind also, you know, I started university in 1968. The Vietnam War was in full swing. The campuses were organizing against it. There was nuclear testing in the South Pacific. The campuses were organizing against it. There were apartheid uh, rugby teams from South Africa touring New Zealand and Australia. Students were organizing against it. That was the context of the time. So mm -hmm. politics, international affairs was very relevant uh, to me. And uh, that's that was my launching pad as a student. Mm. It was a very volatile time. I entered university a year or two after that here in Queensland, Australia. And it was the same, you know, the, the moratorium marches and and all those things. It was a very exciting time to be 19 or 20, wasn't it? <laughs> well, well, it um, was. And, and we had, in a way, the tame version of it in the university campuses in Australia and New Zealand. But one of the things that made a huge impact on me as a student was the uh, Vietnam War protests at Kent State University in, in the US, where a student mm -hmm. was killed by state troopers in the protest. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, my goodness. And then it was also the period when there were student revolutions in France and Germany. You know, mm -hmm. Daniel Cole, uh, Cole Bendit, uh, the, the Fifth Republic of de Gaulle was, was brought yeah. down, really, by st mm -hmm. student unrest and protest. So these were very, very heady times in Europe and, and in, in North America. And we were at the tail end of it with a, a more benign and peaceful version, yeah. but we were a very mobilised generation. It seemed... Uh... It seemed a tame aversion, as you said, but yes, a, a very mobilised generation in that in that era, absolutely. So, um, if we just move through to, so I guess that took you into politics, and then and then on into um, deciding after your university days and um, working in universities into being an elected leader. Uh, can you explore for us the elements that you think? Or, the, or that choice of direction early in your career that underpinned your current success. Like, as I said in the introduction, you're a well-known uh, global world leader working in really critical um, elements of our society. So what underpinned that from, that, from then? I, th I think what underpinned it for me was, was values. You know, th there's, very, there's no glamour in the life of a politician. <laughs> It's just plain hard work. So you have to have a passion for it. 
you have to have a reason for going in that's going to carry you through and give you the resilience to cope with the most uh, difficult of times. Uh, so for me, uh, as a student involved in the protest, what what was depressing but also motivating was when the political party, which would have done something about the issues that I cared about, lost an election for the fourth time in a row. I thought I've got to get off the bench here. You know, I've got to come mm -hmm. out of the movements at the university mm -hmm. and and get involved in the political system. And I think that it was a point for many of us when we said we can't stand back. You know, we, we've got mm -hmm. to pitch in and help. And so that's when I sort of made the, I suppose, the transition across from interest group politics uh, into into active party uh, politics driven by a desire to see uh, policy uh, change and initially of course you know, it was these great foreign policy issues uh, but then as i began to uh, run for local office uh, and then for election as a member of parliament of, of course you know all politics is is local and you become very immersed in from my values perspective, issues of, of social justice and, and equity, um, you know, labour rights, uh, you know, just housing, all, all the issues that are most important to, to people in the, in the community. And that was what uh, carried me through. So I've always been a values driven person, always been in it for, for a reason. Look, I could have chosen an easier life. I've, actually had a good life as a university lecturer, but uh, I, I would never have forgiven myself if I hadn't given politics a go and, and then, of course, been able to go all the way. Yes, and yes, you did go all the way. And so it's interesting, so you've come around to the fact it was your values and your passion that carried you through and the belief that you could make a difference, perhaps. Mm. So it's very clear when I was doing my research and. Um, thinking of how I'd take the conversation today, that you've, you've achieved many firsts for women. So has the country of New Zealand achieved many firsts for women. You've championed inclusion and the empowerment of women in your country and throughout the world in your roles. It's interesting in the latest Global Gender, uh, global gender Gap report from the World Economic Forum uh, that New Zealand has 84% of its gender gap closed. So it's your first, first Prime Minister of your country, first woman to lead the UN uh, Development Group and so on. So what is it? What is it? What's the secret or what's causing a, I think we get a sense of why you've had those first, but why your country and why is it so successful? It's fourth, fourth or fifth in the world on that report as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I mean, New Zealand has done a lot better than many and we now have our third woman prime minister mm -hmm. and for you know, rather more than half of the last you know, 23, 24 years, there's been a woman prime minister in place in New Zealand. So girls are growing up here with you know, really the expectation that on average, you know, half the time, uh, the leader of the country will be female. But they've seen these extremely senior female role models across all spheres, Speaker of Parliament, Chief Justice, very long standing woman Chief Justice who retired was replaced by another woman Chief yes. Chief Justice. Women have headed you know, everything really. Uh, mind you, still uh, the military and the police are holdouts, but uh, we'll get to them, I suppose. <laughs> you think so, we'll get to them sometime? <laughs> <laughs> so, sometime, probably the police before the military. <laughs> there yeah. we go. Uh, so, yeah, lo lots of role models. Also, there's always been pride in New Zealand uh, and I think among men and women, uh, that New Zealand was the first country in the world to uh, uh, have universal franchise. Um, West Australia, I think, was before New Zealand, but it's a, a state rather than a, a country, but full marks to West Australia. Uh, so, yeah, pride in that. Look, look, things didn't move so fast from 1893 when the suffrage came. It wasn't until 19... 19 that women could actually run for parliament and the first woman wasn't elected till 1933 when i went in to parliament in 1981 we were only 
as women 9% of the parliament, which was pathetic. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, over the years, you know, particularly with the coming of proportional representation, that, that was a sort of leap up from a parliament of 20% women in 1993 to 30% in 1996. And when political parties have to uh, draw up party lists and well, it looks a bit odd going to women voters and saying, vote for us if you don't have a lot of women on your list. So yes. the last election delivered pretty close to gender parity in our parliament. I think we're on around 48% women MPs now. So again, you know, just the more gender equality is, the, the more it just you know, get, gets embedded and, and improved. Now, on the gender pay gap, that's now reduced to under 10%. It's about 9.5%. When I started out as PM, it was still around 80%. You know, so that's had to come along a bit. We introduced measures like, uh, you know, paid parental leave, uh, sort of 20 hours free early childcare. You know, things that would support women who wanted to make the choice to go back to work. There's been been quite a lot of policy uh, changes as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I mean, of course, we're far from perfect. There's a lot of things to achieve here, but you know, all things considered, it, it's a lot better than it was when I started banging yeah. a drum on these issues decades ago. Yes, and I think um, in a number of countries, and in my own country, it's certainly improving over time. But when when you look into the data and the information, it is a standout. Your your country and some other countries, it's four or five other countries that are always in that top list and it's interesting to contemplate. So if we follow that thread into the fact that Zonta International does envision a world where women's rights are human rights and all women can achieve their potential, what do you think not-for-profit and community organisations like Zonta, who generally um, are majority women, can do to take those little steps towards the notion of gender parity. Well, Zonta does a lot of things, but what else? You know, you, you spend a lot of time contemplating that from a global perspective. Well, because Zonta is, is global and it has a, you know, a leadership and advocacy role for, for girls and women. Uh, so it, its voice does matter. And, and there's so much to advocate for. I think particularly holding up, you know, the holy grail of education for every girl, every girl being able to take their education as far as, as they possibly can. Because a girl who's forced out of school early to be married, married at puberty and have very early uh, childbearing is, is, is a girl who may never get a second chance. In, in our societies in Australia and New Zealand, you, you will get a second chance if you seek it because we you know, provide for the, the, the schoolgirl with a baby to come back to school. We provide for single parent uh, support. You know, we, we, we do a lot of things to ensure there's a safety net and, and a second chance. That's not the case for a lot of girls. But the COVID-19 mm. pandemic, according to UNESCO, probably resulted in 11 million girls never returning to school after the lockdown. And we know what that means for girls in poor families and poor countries. Take, for example, what's happening in Afghanistan now, which is a, a, a tragedy for, for girls and women. But at, at extremists, we're starting to see the stories now of the poor families selling their girl children into marriage, even contracting them at, 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 as infants uh, to marriage and to go to uh, another another family. So, you know, education, uh, you know, the, the kind of social safety nets which will ensure that the girl child doesn't become the sacrificial lamb when the family's uh, short of money. This is so critical. Secondly, sexual and reproductive health and rights is just so critical. A woman has mm -hmm. to be able to control her fertility. She must make her own her own choices. She must have the means. Uh, to do that, that that's critical. And then economic empowerment. There's still, you know, a lot of um, uh, lack of parity in the access to economic opportunities that men and women have globally. The ability to borrow money, to have a bank account, to, you know, to be able to own land, inherit land. Uh, the, the, these are basics. And then most 
countries actually still have on their statute books some law or other which discriminates against women. So Zonta's voice on more reform to get rid of discriminatory legislation is important. Yes, uh, and and they do have a power. Zonta International does have a powerful presence, um, you know, in the CSW and um, other places around the world. And it's interesting at club level. Uh, sometimes that you know, those of us who are in our individual clubs in our individual communities forget that every time we um, take one step with one woman or one girl, we're making a difference. And my club was reminded of that just this week. Uh, we provide a scholarship to um, early university women around um, to assist them through their studies, uh, particularly if, if there's some disadvantage. And we had this letter written to us from our last recipient. And, you know, the entire club of 60 women was in tears. Like, And then you went, oh, so that two or $3,000 that we provided made that difference for that woman. And you know they'll finish their studies and go on and empower their own daughters in the future. So it's, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it, to remember that we can often do it one woman at a time. Yeah. Uh, fabulous. So um, moving on to um, the notion of code, of course, your name got even more up in lights globally in your recent role as co-chair with the former president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf with that independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response. There's been so much um, discussion and dialogue around the disproportionate effect that COVID has had on women across the world. I'm wondering if you've got some thoughts that you might reflect on with us and your views and lessons you might have learnt from your work on this panel and your work more broadly globally. Mm. Well, I mean, COVID has been a, a catastrophe in, in health terms, broader social and economic terms, and, and it, you know, it, it's had implications for, uh, for peace and security, a total disaster. Now, women have and girls have borne a disproportionate uh, burden for a range of reasons. As I said, the, the dropout rate from school has been significantly higher for for girls from poor homes and in, in poor countries, and that's opportunity denied, which may not ever knock again for those girls unless there's you know, some solidarity to try to, uh, to to make it up uh, for them. And there's been precious little solidarity really around the response to, to COVID, unfortunately. Uh, one of my tasks is chairing the board of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health, which is headquartered in WHO. And we, of course, have been particularly concerned about the impact on sexual reproductive health services, because strange as it may seem, uh, these services didn't seem to be classified as essential services, which must go on regardless of what's happening in the world around. I mean, the, the, the truth is that pandemic or no pandemic, uh, women and girls are getting pregnant, they're having babies, and they need the, you know, the services that go with that. And that became extremely difficult. The world's midwives on the front line were often the last to get the, uh, the personal protective equipment. They were operating considerable danger, huge risk of burnout. You know, we're, we're probably 900,000 midwives short or will be by, by 2030 without huge recruitment of retention. Yet our midwives are, are poorly paid and supported. Uh, so... It, it is inevitable, sadly, that we will see, uh, when the statistics come in, a rise in maternal mortality as a result of what happened with the disruption of services. When the World Health Organization surveyed uh, on service disruption under COVID in general, about a third of countries reported disruption in the sexual and reproductive health area, which meant uh, lack of access to contraception, to safe abortion, uh, to birthing, and postnatal uh, services. So there's, there's, there's all of that area of concern. Uh, another uh, major concern has been uh, the rise in domestic violence, particularly during lockdowns, because women and, and girls and, and, and children, boys and girls, uh, ended up confined in homes with violent family members and, and with, with no way out. And there's been huge spikes uh, during lockdowns to uh, hotline services for domestic violence is where they exist, and they don't always exist. There's been a lot of suffering and silence uh, there and, and people trying to flee uh, violent homes and, and places where there's 
there's no sanctuary or inadequate sanctuary. Uh, put on top of all that, of course, uh, COVID has led to uh, impoverishment. Uh, the numbers of people in extreme poverty in our world as a result of COVID have probably risen by at least 125 million and, and still counting. Uh, the numbers of, of uh, severely hungry people will have risen by roughly uh, the same amount. Uh, so, yeah, disaster, disaster. And girls and women have felt the heaviest burden of this. So it seems to me that it's like a disaster recovery mode. My mind immediately goes to when it's such a disaster, how do we do disaster recovery? Because that's what you do after natural disaster events, don't we? You know, we, everyone goes into that um, the leadership that is about disaster. So it'll be really interesting to see how countries a respond to this from that emergency leadership frame. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And make sure that, you know, girls and women are part of the redesign of that. Mm -hmm. Because what we've seen with the COVID uh, response efforts around the world is, is again, a gender disparity in who are the teams making uh, the, these decisions. They've been very, very male dominated. Uh, when we had a consultation with, with midwives, in the course of the work of the independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response. I mean, that, no one was coming to the midwives asking what they needed and what they thought. So, you know, as, as we rebuild, there's got to be a gender lens on that. And, and for rebuilding in the health system, uh, we need uh, to ensure that, that health system resilience uh, identifies that range of essential services that must go on and sexual and reproductive health services are part of that. As we rebuild, can we do something for all those girl children who've missed out on their schooling and, and, and never gone back? You know, what, what can we do to try and put things right? Uh, can we learn the lessons of you know, the, the, the need for, for sanctuary uh, during lockdowns? Lockdowns have a place, but you've got to look after people. You know, mm. th there's got to be refuges where people can, can flee. So lots of things to think about. Mm. Yes, it's it's yeah, a tragedy really all round. So um, there's a lot of work to be done to recover. Can we can we move on to sustainability? Because a large part of your leadership as the Prime Minister and now globally is in that whole sustainability and climate change. And of course, we're on the cusp of the big um, conventional meeting in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. So I'd be really interested in you sharing some thoughts around how individuals and organisations can be part of the solution, because we hear it from a political frame. So I guess what's that alignment between the political frame and what countries do and what all of us can do? Well, I think those of us living in, in high income countries, there's a lot that we can do as individuals and families. Uh, you know, we, we, need, we need to look at our own carbon footprint and be conscious of that. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of our societies haven't designed for uh, sustainability. We've had the motor car dominated cities. Uh, you know, we've been energy intensive. We, we haven't looked at energy efficiency a lot. We've, we've just been so wasteful in so many ways. So as individuals, look at our footprint. You know, can we, can we keep our energy demand down? Can we change our transport modes? Uh, you know, what about our waste, you know, zero waste to landfill, landfills and methane uh, oozing? Uh, what about our agriculture? Are we looking at the carbon footprint of how it's produced and making ethical decisions? Uh, are we looking at, at what we purchase um, as imports and how it's been produced? You know, one of the campaigns I've been in behind for years is, um, uh, you know, zero deforestation supply chains for products like palm oil, which end up in our mm -hmm. soap. You know, who, who wants to buy soap knowing that it just fell the forest in, in Kalimantan in, in Indonesia? Mm. So you know, there's a lot of things we can do as, as ethical consumers, but then we need to take our concern into the demands we make of our political leaders at, at the city level, uh, state level, uh, national level as, as well. Now, uh, in developing countries uh, and for the poorest, thing, things are not so simple. I mean, you know, I, you know, you, you, you weep really to go uh, to countries where the, the tropical forest is being uh, lost uh, because of uh, clearance for subsistence agriculture. 
Uh, you know, this is a development issue. We need to stop the clearance, but support sustainable livelihoods that aren't based on on forest uh, clearance. We also see um, a tree clearance for energy because you know, people need to, you know, have have fuel for the cooking fire, and, and often you know the three stone fire is the most inefficient use of, of energy you can think of. Uh, so we we need uh, solutions at scale uh, for modern energy and sustainable uh, agriculture in developing countries, and you know there can be support at all kinds of levels for this mm -hmm. from the, the Zonta project which supports you know sustainable energy and agricultural initiatives for women you know right through to what the the FAO and the International Fund for Agricultural Development and the, the big development donors and and organizations can can do but there's got to be change because in the end if you if you say to a poor woman you can't use that wood she's going to say well what am I to use there are alternatives but the alternatives have to be made accessible and affordable mm, yes yes absolutely and today it's interesting our current president Sharon Langenbeck's on the call and I'm sure she's listening with interest as well because I know Zont has taken steps uh, this year, this biennium, of our two-year biennium, to in, involve itself at global level in the climate change and sustainability space. So, uh, you know, it's it's really good that I think as an organisation we're working into that space as well and hoping to have some influence. Yeah. Uh, can yeah. I move us on to the more personal thing about leadership, Helen? Uh, mentoring is a really interesting topic and in all the guests that I talk to each month I raise the notion of mentoring and uh, what's your view of mentoring and uh, did, did you have mentoring? I know that you probably mentor a lot of people yourself. Did it happen for you and what, how do you think it fits in terms of assisting women to reach their potential? Well, when I was moving around as Prime Minister, I'd sometimes go to a school and a child or student would say to me, Miss Clark, who was your role model when you were growing up or who, who was your mentor? And I said, well, it, you know, it wasn't really like that. We didn't have mentors. I suppose if you thought about it, um, you know, you, 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 well, your teachers had big classes. They didn't have a lot of time to spend on you. I think it was when I got to to university, there were two particular outstanding staff in the leadership of the political studies department who took a huge interest in students and really supported us, you know, with our thinking and 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 development. That that was important. Uh, so these days mentoring can be a lot more structured and no doubt organizations like Zonta, certainly YWCA and others, uh, try to consciously link uh, people uh, to uh, to mentors. Uh, you know, I, I think it is important. I think you know, young people often they want someone to bounce ideas off, look at possibilities. Uh, I've you know, over the years put a lot of time back into talking to uh, particularly senior high school students who are sort of thinking about the uh, the way ahead. So I, I can only encourage you know women who have done the hard yards and. And moved up these fast lane careers uh, to you know to be prepared to put time back in uh, with with young women to inspire them to to know that they can go all the way in achieving their dreams and potential. It's to help them see what they want to be in a way, isn't it? And yes. and 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 so much. I'm a teacher by trade originally, and uh, sometimes we forget the effect that teachers have in that and it, and it, mentoring ties in with education, doesn't it? Like teachers can be the first mentors for young people as well, and particularly for women. Can I move on to um, a little bit about yourself again? Leadership's so essential in all areas of family, and that's what we're basically talking about this morning and determines our future. What do you think your powers and gifts are and how you've utilised these in your work, in your various types of work you've done? What do you think are the true powers or gifts that allow you to do what you do? Well, when I reflect, I think I've been quite a good listener. You need to have an, an open ear to what people are thinking and what they're worried about and what, what their hopes are. 
uh, and as a political leader, you know, you can you can dash those hopes or you can do something to to realise them. So I think listening, uh, empathising, uh, consulting, uh, and then being prepared to you know work on you know practical solutions, initiatives which will really make a difference. So I've always been an action oriented person. Uh, not particularly interested in theory. I, I say I'm more interested in what works in practice than what works in theory. Uh, so I like to, you know, take take a, a problem or a challenge, analyse why it's happening, look at what steps you could take uh, to do something about it, and, and then do it. That was very much the approach taken most recently with this work on the independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response. We said. Now, look, look, we're not here to do a witch hunt. We're here to find out what happened, why did it happen, and what could change that would make a difference and stop it happening again. Very practical. And, uh, that, and that's really been the way I've led through my life. And, uh, of course, in, in the go forward from the pandemic and after the report that you and um, Ellen Johnson Surly have put together, it is about that isn't it? It is about practical solutions to make a difference and to help the recovery effort from from yep. the pandemic, which is still upon us in in most countries in the world. That's right. Following on from that, what therefore, what characteristics do you think remarkable leaders have in common? So the women you work with, the men you work with, the, the people you've looked at. What do you think are the characteristics that really make them powerful and remarkable? Well, I think the, the characteristics I've just described are extremely important, but then you have to add another one. You have to have the courage to stand out front and act. And that's not that's not always easy. You know? <laughs> not everyone agrees with you. But one of the best bits of advice I got from a senior politician when I was a young politician was he said, you've got to realise, Helen, that actually, uh, even in your own electorate, uh, you know, the, the, the chances of getting more than 50% of the vote are a bit remote. So the mm. chances are that you know 50% or more of people won't have voted for you, and at the nationwide level, that that's true too. It's very rare for a party to get more than 50% of the vote, mm. or anything mm. like it in a, in a democratic yeah. election. So he said you're going to be sort of making your way as a politician, uh, knowing that when you say something, more than half people never voted for you. But you have to be able to appeal to reason and principle and, and make a case and, you know, you have to be tolerant and accepting that people have different points of view. So I think that was very good advice to me early on. A lot of people are never going to agree with you, but you would like to, you know, establish a track record for predictability, uh, sound judgment, seriousness of purpose. So that even if you don't get agreement, you you do you know get respect. Hmm. And respect for the direction you've taken, based on the fact you've consulted and listened and all the things you've talked about. Thank yeah. you. When things get tough and when the confidence and resilience drop, how does how does Helen deal with that? Well, again, you know, it's it's resilience, isn't it, which is built up. Um, by by experience. Look, life is full of knocks and you can let them overwhelm you or you can see them as a challenge to overcome. And I've, you know, like, like everyone, you have setbacks along the way. I haven't won every election. Uh, from the time I was selected for a safe Labour electorate in New Zealand, yes, I, I won every election as an MP, 10, 10 in a row. Uh, but, you know, I've seen highs and lows of the political cycle for my, for my party. Uh, when I was first elected, you know, that was the you know, election <laughs> that we lost in 1981. And, and that was after losing 1975, 1978, 1981. Yes. And then we won in 84. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of things went wrong with, with that government. Uh, and we were out of office again in 1990. And then we lost in 93, 96. And one in '99, which is when I became prime minister. So you have to have the sort of personality that will take the rough with the smooth. Um, you have to you know, sort of keep to your basic values, principles, long-term perspective, because it's not always going to work out in the short term. In fact, it might be quite disastrous. 
so keep keep your family close, keep your friends close, keep your mm. you know good core of colleagues close, keep your mm. sounding boards in the community. Mm. Those are the things that are going to see you through. Don't ever try and bear this whole burden on your own shoulders alone because you will go under. You need networks mm. of support. And and networks of support for different times and different places and different people yep. we go to. Yep. Fabulous. So I've been using this question a little um, more recently in the conversation. I think one of the behaviours that um, helps us as leaders is what we read, watch and listen to, whether it's professional or personal. So what, what, what's one of your, some of your favourite go-to topics or places for reading, listening and watching when you have time? Yeah, well, I mean... So I'm a great lover of the arts. Nothing would make me happier right now than to be sitting in an opera house. And <laughs> one of the great joys of being in New York for eight years at the UN was the Metropolitan Opera. I went so <laughs> many times every season. I, I love the opera. Um, I love the opportunities I've had in the past to come across to Sydney and go to the opera, hopefully possible again. We have a little opera in New Zealand, but not, not enough. I've just become mm. the patron of the opera company to try and you know, help, help give a profile. <laughs> but uh, that, that I, I really love opera. Look, I've been a, a classical music buff all my life. I began learning classical piano at seven and went right through to I was mm. almost 18. Uh, I've been to so many classical <laughs> orchestral concerts. I love the ballet, you know, and, and I've been Minister of Arts, Culture and Heritage in, mm. in New Zealand. I appointed myself as that as, mm. as PM because <laughs> I wanted the clout of the Prime Minister's office and behind mm. the the arts, you know, Prime Minister's mm. literary awards, all, all of these things. So, mm. yeah, the, the, the arts for me are extremely uh, important. The other thing that's important to me is is the great outdoors. I mean, I am, a, you know, a great hiker, backcountry skier. You know, I've, I've had the opportunity in life to do not only most of the great walks in New Zealand and a lot of a lot of others that people have never heard of uh, mm. to do wonderful backcountry skiing in the South Island uh, mountains. I've had the opportunity to do a lot of skiing in Europe and North America, uh, cross country. I've climbed Kilimanjaro. I've been 6,000 metres up back on Kaga. I've, I've mm. trekked in the, in the, in the Everest uh, area, the Second mm. Arthur uh, National Park. I mean, what, what haven't I done? And mm. I, I find enormous you know, solitude in getting, mm. getting out and in wild and special places. Mm, that's lovely. Thank you. Well, what? Um, just a final one there, and there's quite a few questions, so I'll I'll put some of the questions in the Q and A to you as as well, Helen. But just before I do that, what's next for you? What goals and ambitions? Because um, I'm sure you have some. <laughs> well, uh, I am so busy. You know, when I when I ceased being PM, people say, oh, what are you going to do? And I've always been of the view that one door closes, another opens, mm -hmm. or you know, the door opened to go to uh, the UN for eight years, mm -hmm. and that was incredible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I did two terms. Those mm -hmm. That comes to an end as well. So people say, what are you going to do? I said, well, you know, the phone will ring. <laughs> did it ever. Never <laughs> stop ringing the emails, never <laughs> stop coming. I, I am so busy. I mean, I chair a number of. Uh, public good uh, boards mm -hmm. and initiatives mm -hmm. and member of others are doing an enormous amount of uh, video conferencing events like like this across mm -hmm. quite a range of areas, very involved in global health, uh, still do quite a lot on sustainability, SDGs, mm -hmm. uh, yep. climate action, women's leadership, uh, I mean, you name it, international affairs, geopolitics, mm -hmm. Asia Pacific, you know, multilateral yep. system. I, I keep a broad range of interests, and I, that's just the way life, life's going to be. I mean, for me, being locked down in New Zealand since March last year, I, I've really enjoyed it. You can still be very much involved in the world, mm -hmm. working as we are right now online, but I've also had the time to be home, uh, see more of my, my family than I'd seen in, mm -hmm. in, in years, and it's been, for me, personally quite rewarding. That's lovely. Um, so if I can just flow on from that. Um, one of the questions here from Nilufa is about the Helen Clark Foundation. And I must admit, I did trawl through some of your speeches and all sorts of things on your website prior to today, as you would have expected. But um, the Helen Clark Foundation piqued my interest. 
And uh, there's a question here from Nilu Fahu from Bangladesh, and she's interested in, is the foundation involved in anything to do with the education of women and girls in developing countries? Or perhaps you could um, just give us a short version of what it does. It, it's not a, a grant making body. In fact, I often say to my husband who, who set it up and chairs the board, uh, you should have uh, called it an institute you know, like mm. Australian Institute or whatever, because it, yes. it's a public policy think tank. And because it has mm -hmm. charitable status in New Zealand, uh, it, its aims and objectives must be to benefit uh, New Zealand and New Zealand is in, in some way. So mm. it's set up around a public policy debate and, uh, and briefs and recommendations, mm -hmm. which can, of course, take us into the foreign policy and, and mm. global sustainability issues because you know, New Zealand's a global uh, citizen as well. So. Yeah, we're, we've um, we've published on a range of issues. We've, our very first report was around the potential for green hydrogen in New Zealand, which is you know the coming the coming power source. Uh, but in the during the pandemic, of course, we've everyone pivots to be relevant to that. We've looked at issues like like the loneliness and well-being, and what policy issues arise from that. Uh, you know, what about our, our diaspora coming home? What are, are their expectations of our society? Yeah, quite a, quite a broad range of issues. We hosted this uh, conversation with, with Kevin Rudd on uh, the relationships of China uh, with our region uh, in, in the last couple of weeks, which was extremely uh, interesting. So, yeah, that, that's the kind of era of debate we're in. Fabulous. There's a couple of questions focusing in on the First Nations people of New Zealand, uh, one from Susan and one from Nancy about uh, the Māori Ma people, uh, the First Nations people and the treaty that New Zealand leadership formed and whether those relationships and the way New Zealand's gone forward with its First Nations people has in fact contributed to the gender parity situation in New Zealand. That's the broad brush. Has it improved the status of women as a result of, of that um, work that's been done in partnership? Well, obviously, you know, from the time of colonisation, uh, New Zealand did a lot of things wrong, but got some things right. Uh, there was Maori representation in the New Zealand Parliament from the 1860s, as of right. And when the uh, universal suffrage came to New Zealand in 1893, Maori women were part of the universal suffrage. There was never that, that discrimination. So there's been a, a, a voice for Maori in the New Zealand Parliament since the 80, 1860s. And, and these days, it, it's actually, a, it, it's, a, it's a big voice. You know, Māori are roughly 15% of the New Zealand population and the, the very, very strong representation of, of at least that, that level, if not mm. more, uh, uh, these days. So that's, that's been uh, very, very uh, important. Uh, the mm. treaty basis to the relationship uh, between Māori and the state of New Zealand it is important because it's it's been uh, the basis on which a lot of rights have been negotiated and a lot of restoration of, of loss during the uh, colonial period. Uh, in, 19, in the 1970s, a Labour government here set up what was called the Waitangi Tribunal, because it's the Treaty of Waitangi, and it began to look at contemporary grievances, which Māori had. And then uh, you know, a decade later, the next Labour government said that claims and injustices pursuant to the treaty it could be examined going back to the time of colonisation. And it's under that that there's then been these major investigations and historical treaty settlements which involve restoration of uh, property, uh, recompense for what was lost, apologies, uh, and, and so on. So, it's an ongoing process and, and journey in in New Zealand, but and the process is very important. You know, there's not necessarily an end point to this journey, mm. but the process is important. Mm. And it's that process that leads to, and here in Australia, of course, we call it reconciliation, but 
you know, that the process matters and for everything really, doesn't it? The process matters. Yeah. There's a, a, a really short question here about from Samantha, how is climate change a gender quality issue, gender equality issue, so when you look at them both together? Well, that, that was something I spoke a lot about at, at UNDP because you know, climate change exacerbates uh, all existing vulnerabilities. And women you know, are still more disadvantaged in our world than, than men. So if you have women, for example, in subsistence agriculture, they tend to have the least productive and fertile land, uh, the least access to the inputs that you need uh, to, to produce uh, sustainably. Uh, for the subsistence farmer in the Sahel uh, and, and in other dry lands, you know, climate change, which makes the one in a hundred year drought come far more frequently, is going to impact very, very adversely. Uh, where you get displacement from disaster, uh, and you do get forced displacement from, uh, for example, drought, uh, then the track of the families begins to the you know, informal settlements, often on the, the fringes of, a, of mm -hmm. an urban area where life is damn hard for women and, mm -hmm. and, and girls. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've, I just think of so many you know, wretched sites, mm -hmm. uh, for example, going to Afghanistan in early 2019 uh, mm -hmm. when there you know, was under the radar for most of the international community, a very, very mm -hmm. bad drought. And you saw you know, the outcome of, for the families who trekked from their land with their animals having died to the edge of the of the urban centres and very, very hungry and thin women with children literally starving who ended up in the, you know, the, the, the extremely sick children's ward of a hospital. So it, 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 it's extremely tough for, uh, for women. And, uh, you know, let, let's have those images of, in our mind of families being driven off their land because of, of, of what's happening. You know, we do have climate change refugees and, and, and displacement. And if we carry on the course we're, we're on for global warming, not peaking at 1.5 or two degrees, but somewhere around three, it's, it's going to get a lot tougher. We, we have to act. As it is for some of the islands in the South Pacific, which between your country and, and mine as well. It's, yes, it's a it's a, a very very um, emotive situation and difficult for us all. There's um, a thread of thought here from Maria about cultural wealth and the exploration she has been doing around linguistic capital, which she defines as a voice that's heard and valued in community, and she feels hers is coming off our lived wisdom, etc. Um, what do you think we can do about helping women to be able to utilise this linguistic capital or having a voice or, or being heard? Mm. Um, I'm wondering whether the, the question is always also getting at the issue of, of language retention, mm. because, you know, often we talk about you know, biodiversity and the, the risk of you know, the million species of extinction uh, by 2030, but um, less talked about is linguistic or language extinction. Uh, yeah. And, you know, in New Zealand, we're in a, you know, battle against time to keep the Maori language as a living language. And I know Australia yeah. has had enormous and rich linguistic yeah. diversity, but these languages are under, are under terrible, terrible pressure. Yeah. And you need you know, language nests for small children. You need to be mm. tapping the, the still the, the the first language speakers among mm. the the older generations to mm. to keep this alive. And and people, you know, will always be most articulate in 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 their first language. That you know, mm. it, it sort of governs the way one one mm. thinks and expresses mm. and. And, and, and so on. So I think there's there's huge agendas here for both New Zealand and Australia and, and many other countries as well. Yes, and as you say, the articulateness in your first language. Those of us who attempt to speak a second language, I understand that immensely. And and it is 
so many things being lost and it starts again with education doesn't it, it starts again mm -hmm. with engaging young young children in uh, that diverse range of languages thank you thank you for picking that question up I want to hear about how do you think your lived experience as a woman has impacted your work and your contributions in um, transforming society oh I think I think it's had a profound influence mm -hmm. uh, because you're looking at you know policy issues from you know y your own life life experience and mm -hmm. as I said when we began I mean you know life went life life man, truly has treated me pretty well I'm privileged to have been born mm -hmm. when I was in the country mm. I was in, in the, in the family I was born into, and to have had the opportunities that I had, um, but I also had to, you know, make my own luck. Uh, it it wasn't mm. uh, straightforward. So I, you know, I do know what it's like to have people think that you shouldn't be able to do something because you're a woman. I remember first uh, running for uh, selection and then the candidacy uh, for. Uh, the safe labor electorate uh, in in Auckland in 1981 and Auckland had only ever had one woman MP before this is New Zealand's biggest city right mm. somewhere you know mm. between a quarter and a third of the population it had one woman MP elected in a by-election in 1943 mm. who was defeated mm. in 1946 pathetic mm. And so there was no lived experience in Auckland of women MPs and, and very few anywhere else. There'd never been more than four women MPs in the New Zealand Parliament. And so as I began you know, to go around, there were voices saying, oh, she'll never do any good here. And people say, why not? I said, well, you know, this is a working man's electorate. They'll never vote for her. And you're thinking, good grief, you know, these working men, they've got mothers, most of them have got wives. Many of them have got daughters and sisters. I mean, don't don't these non people have a vote as well? You know, so so it, there was that you know, just basic pushback against the notion that a woman could represent an electorate. So mm -hmm. you never forget these things. You know, it, it may seem old hat now, but you know, I took that lived experience into my life and never accepting that any door is closed to women and what i say to young women is see that empty space at a table at a decision making table it's got your name on it go for yeah. it don't ever accept that that's not for you thanks helen we're coming close to time and and you in your busy world in mine so there's a couple of questions i haven't got to but i've tried to represent the um, ideas that have come through on the chat and q a this morning have you got a final word to leave with our audience today well, I think the final word is never give up. You know, life mm. life does deliver its challenges. It, it's not a sort of linear, smooth ride for any of us. But you know, have a bigger vision about what you can achieve and what you can put back into your society, and and be guided by that, and and build the networks of family, friends, colleagues, support that will carry you through what will inevitably be the odd rough spot, but you mm. can transcend it. Thank you, Helen. There are so many comments on the chat about um, how incredible the experience has been having you in conversation with me today on behalf of Bonto International. So I hope you leave today knowing that once again, you've had an influence over more than 100 people online today and the other three or 400 who registered who no doubt will listen to the recording when it goes live. I'll provide it back to your, your people, of course, for you to use should you wish when it's available. So again, thank you so much. Thank you for fitting us into the schedule and thank you for giving back time to Zonta International. We're so proud to have you in our family. And this has been an awesome morning for me and I'll go away incredibly uplifted as a result of our conversation. So thank you very, very much on behalf of Zonta International. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, everyone. Go well and go safely.